Locks are used to deter or deny access to certain areas or certain uh, compartments. Depending on the level of robustness of your lock, you may consider it a tool to deny access or to deter and delay access. A padlock, like this master lock here, can only delay access to uh, a fence it's applied to or a cabinet. It can be easily defeated using some simple lock picking tools in just a matter of seconds. So you really need to consider the robustness of the lock when it comes to determining what you're protecting. Do you want to protect it with something that can be defeated with just a couple pieces of metal or do you want to have something that's a little more secure and may require some additional controls. Key locks are the most traditional types of locks and these need to be managed. They're controlled with a physical key. These types of locks need to be managed uh, with a key management system that we'll talk about a little later. And those keys, if compromised, require the change in the entire lock. If the key is lost or stolen, you need to change the entire lock. This can be very costly. Cipher locks require a combination. And it's usually a keypad that accepts electronic input, but cipher locks exist that are purely mechanical and can be used uh, to provide mechanical only access. Cipher locks need to be changed, or the cipher itself needs to be changed periodically. Otherwise, the cipher keys will get worn and become very easy for an attacker to guess the combination. I've had many instances in my career where I can just look at a cipher lock <clears throat> and then determine which numbers are more worn than others. Maybe the one key, the three key, and the four key are more worn. So it's very easy to try combinations, four, one, three, or one and four together, then three, et cetera, et cetera. It really limits the number of combinations you need to try. And it becomes very easy to guess a combination or perform basically a brute force attack, but with a limited character set on that type of lock. Ciphers can also be shared freely. <clears throat> you can give out ciphers to anyone and somebody who knows the cipher can tell somebody else. You as a security professional have no idea who the cipher is being shared with. You only have uh, users assurance that they won't share the cipher, which isn't very much, honestly. So the best solution, the most modern solution is RFID or radio frequency identification batch or key fob. And this can be something that service serves as both a badge, an identification badge, and also uh, a authentication device. These types of locks will have an RFID sensor <clears throat> and the RFID sensor reads the badge and authenticates the person. It reads information on a chip off the badge itself and that chip contains information on who the person is and you know their level of access. The level of access and the permissions for each user can be managed in a central location uh, using traditional uh, access control lists managed by a computer. So RFID badges themselves don't need to have a power source. The way RFID works in many instances, there's a couple different types, but with most badges, the RFID sensor will actually emit an electrical pulse wirelessly to the badge, which will activate that chip momentarily and allow the chip to transmit information. So in this sense, these badges are I think the best option, clearly, uh, not only can individuals wear the badge to show that they belong to the organization and to demonstrate who they are, but they can also use the badge to gain access to various levels of facility and control the locks. Biometrics are also an excellent solution. A retina scanner or a fingerprint scanner could be very helpful and you can authenticate users and ensure that the user is who they say they are. With a badge, if you have access to somebody else's badge, or you grab somebody else's badge, you can enter a facility and the logging mechanisms will log that the person who, the person, uh, the badge, that person is the person who entered the facility, not the person who actually possessed the badge. But with a biometric scanner, that basically eliminates that possibility or greatly mitigates it. 
The problem with biometric scanners is they're subject to error rates. So you want to, we've talked about error rates with biometrics in a previous section, but you want to tweak your biometric scanner to not allow false positive. False positives are where your biometric scanner uh, admits a person who is not authorized into an area. However, if the biometric scanner has trouble, uh, maybe recognizing a face or an iris or a fingerprint, then you might have trouble with individuals who are authorized users entering a facility. If you use biometrics in conjunction with a badge or a key or a cipher, then you have multi-factor authentication. You have something you are, the biometric, and something you have, the badge or the key, or maybe something you know with the cipher. Ciphers and biometrics together are a very good solution if your organization does not like the use of badges because now you have multi-factor authentication. It's not a big of a deal if your cipher is being shared freely because you still have that biometrics to back it up. When it comes to small device security, you want to use cable locks for laptops. And laptops are the most commonly deployed uh, way of granting users their own computer. So cable locks are locks that are fixed to the laptop itself and then tie they usually have a cable and that cable is affixed to a table or a wall or something that makes it very difficult for an individual to grab the entire laptop and walk away with it. Laptops are delaying tools I'd say. They're delaying controls because they can be defeated with uh, cracking techniques on the lock itself or by cutting the wire with a pair of wire cutters. But they still offer a deterrent because it, it shows that the organization is committed to a security and it also uh, delays an attacker from taking multiple laptops in a very small period of time. It takes time to crack that combination on the, the cable lock or uh, pick the lock or to cut the cable. Privacy screens and laptop placement is very important to ensure individuals cannot do what's known as shoulder surfing or even observe laptops and monitors from outside the organization. So you always want to make sure that you orient laptops away from observable windows. When I say observable windows, I mean windows that the attacker has a reasonable chance of observing from. So if you have a five-story building and there's no other buildings around you, you can have your laptops facing the windows on the top stories because it is very unlikely an attacker will get a proper viewing angle to read your secrets on the fifth floor. But if it's the first floor, maybe consider not having uh, or having a, like screens on your windows that allow you know one-way screens where you can look out without looking in, like a privacy screen for an individual laptop, or just orienting all the laptops to face away from the windows, which is usually preferable because then users can actually see out the windows too when they're working. Privacy screens are devices that fit onto a laptop screen and prevent viewing from any angle except for the direct angle. So for the user of the laptop, there's no difference. But for anybody trying to shoulder surf from a different angle, it creates like a Venetian blind effect and will block access. <laughs> Thank you.